Chapter Twenty of the Convict by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty. We must now return for a short time to Mr. Dudley, having brought up many of the other personages connected with this tale, nearly to the same point at which we last left himself. As soon as he had entered the lodge in the custody of the two constables, he demanded in a calm tone to see their warrant, entertaining but little doubt that he had been apprehended for taking some share in the riots of which he had been a witness and that the ignorance of the men who held him in custody had occasioned the use of such very vague and unsatisfactory terms as murder or manslaughter as the case may be what was his astonishment however when he read as follows to the constable of the hundred of blank in the county of blank and all the other peace officers of the same county for as much as patrick ferrers of the parish of brandon in the said county servant hath this day made information before me stephen conway esq one of her majesty's justices of the peace in and for the said county that he hath just cause to suspect and doth suspect that edward dudley esq on the blank day of blank in the year of our lord eighteen blank at or near the place called clive down in the said parish of brandon in the said county feloniously wilfully and of his malice aforethought did kill and murder henry lord hadley by striking him sundry blows and throwing him over the cliff at the said place by which the said lord hadley instantly died these are therefore to command you or one of you in her majesty's name forthwith to apprehend and bring before me or some other of her majesty's justices of the peace in and for the said county the body of the said edgar dudley to answer unto the said charge and be farther dealt with according to the law herein fail not good heaven he exclaimed in a tone of astonishment which could not be assumed do you mean to say that lord hadley has been killed come come master that won't do said the dull brute into whose hands he had fallen you know all about it i dare say you must march into that ere room till to-morrow morning for there's no use in taking you twenty miles to the jail to bring you back again to-morrow to the crowner's quest it was with great difficulty that dudley restrained his temper the charge at first sight seemed to him ridiculous and he would have scoffed at it if horror at the fate of his unhappy pupil had not occupied his mind so completely that no light thought could find place i ask you civilly sir he said moving into the room pointed out closely followed by the constables to give me some information in regard to facts which i must know to-morrow morning and in which i am deeply interested if you are so discourteous as to refuse me an answer i cannot force you but at the same time i suppose there is nobody on earth but yourself who would think of denying me some information respecting a friend who i gather from your warrant has been killed very like a friend to pitch him over the cliff answered the constable howsomedever the magistrates know all about it and you had better wait and talk to them for if you talk more to me i shall send down for the handcuffs a fool i was for not bringing them with me we shall sit up with you by turns for i'm not going to let you get off master you may depend on it dudley only replied by a contemptuous smile and seating himself in a chair he gave himself up to thought while the one constable took a place opposite and the other retired and locked the door for nearly two hours dudley remained meditating over the strange turn which had taken place in his fate and as he reflected upon various circumstances which had occurred during the evening his situation began to assume a more serious aspect than it had at first presented not that he supposed for one moment he was in the slightest danger for his consciousness of innocence was too great to admit of his believing that when his whole conduct was explained even a suspicion would rest upon him but he recollected the violent dispute which he had had with lord hadley in the morning in the presence of several witnesses and also called to mind that when he had gone out after dinner in order to fulfil his promises to eda he had been followed and overtaken by lord hadley and that the first part at least of their conversation had been carried on in a sharp and angry tone he remembered too that they had met several people and that though in the end the young nobleman had seemed somewhat touched by his remonstrances 
and surprised and vexed at his decided resignation of all farther responsibility regarding his conduct no one had witnessed the more moderate and kindly manner in which they had parted or could prove that they had parted at all before the fatal occurrence of which he had such vague information the attempt to extract anything more from the constable he saw would be in vain though he thirsted for intelligence and his thoughts after dwelling for some time upon his own case naturally turned to the unhappy youth who had been cut off at so early a period in the midst of a career of folly and vice he could not help sighing over such a result for notwithstanding headstrong passions and a certain degree of weakness of character which would have prevented lord hadley from ever becoming a great man dudley had perceived some traits of goodness in his nature which under right direction either by the care of wise and prudent friends or by the chastening rod of adversity might have been so guided as to render him an estimable and useful member of society his mind reverted to his own young days and he recollected wild schemes rash enterprises some faults and follies which he now greatly regretted and he thought if i had gone on the pampered child of prosperity i might perhaps have been like him he did himself injustice it is true but still the fancy was a natural one and he felt at least that in his case the uses of adversity had been sweet the body and the mind are alternately slaves to each other when stimulated to strong exertion the mind conquers the body when oppressed with fatigue or sickness the body conquers the mind but the powers of both seem sometimes worn out together and then sleep is the only resource that heavy overpowering sleep the temporary death of all the faculties when no memory of the past no knowledge of the present no expectation of the future comes in dreams to rouse even fancy from the benumbing influence that overshadows us such was the case with dudley at the end of those two hours he had gone out early in the morning in the pursuit of healthful exercise but in the course of his ramble with edgar adelon subjects had arisen which moved him deeply his young companion with all the warm enthusiasm and confidence of his nature had poured forth to him all the stores of grief anxiety and indignation which had been accumulating in silence and in secret since first he had become aware of lord hadley's pursuit of helen and dudley entering warmly into his feelings had chosen his course at once he had determined to speak decidedly to his pupil to place before his eyes the scandal and the wickedness of that which he was engaged in to demand that it should either cease at once or he quit brandon and in case he refused to resign all farther control over him and instantly to make the young peer's relations in london aware of the fact and the cause then had come the fierce and angry discussion with lord hadley followed by the agitating conversation with eda another dispute with his pupil perhaps more painful than the first the hurried and anxious walk to barhampton and the troubled scene which had taken place there he was exhausted mentally and corporeally and at the end of two hours he slept leaning his head upon his folded arms and remaining so still and silent that it seemed as if death rather than slumber possessed him his sleep lasted long too and he was aroused only by some one shaking him roughly by the shoulder on the following morning dudley started up and wondered where he was but gradually a recollection of all the facts returned and the man's words come master the crowner is sitting required no explanation somewhat to dudley's surprise when he reached the door of the lodge he found the carriage of sir arthur adelon waiting for him and entering with one constable while the other took his seat upon the box he was driven up the avenue to brandon house the servants at the door showed no signs of want of respect and he was immediately conducted between his two captors into the library where he found a number of persons assembled in a confused mass at the end of the room and the coroner's jury seated round the large table near the windows in the centre was a portly man in a white waistcoat with a pompous wine empurpled face and an exceedingly bold head whom he concluded rightly to be the coroner several magistrates were also in the room amongst whom were two persons with whom he had dined at the table of sir arthur adelon a few days before but dudley looked in vain for the baronet himself or for any well-known and friendly face he wanted no support it is true 
for he was not timid by nature, and he was conscious of innocence, but yet he would have felt well pleased to have had friends around him. One of the magistrates shook hands with him, however, and the other bowed, while some people near the coroner whispered to that officer, whose eyes were instantly fixed upon the newcomer. "'Mr. Edward Dudley, I believe,' he said aloud, and when Dudley signified that it was so by bending his head, the other continued, "'Although not strictly necessary, sir, inasmuch as this is an inquest for the purpose of ascertaining how a certain person met with his death, and we consequently as yet know nothing of accused or accusers, yet, as we have been given to understand that a warrant has been issued for your apprehension, under the hand of my worshipful friend Mr. Conway, I have thought it best that you should be present, in order that you should watch proceedings in which you are deeply interested.' you will remark that it is not necessary for you to say anything upon this occasion and to do so or not must be left to your own discretion i thank you for your caution sir replied dudley although having been bred to the bar it was not so necessary in my case as it might be in some i have no knowledge of the circumstances which have caused any suspicion to fall upon me and shall hear with interest the evidence which may be given regarding facts that i am utterly unacquainted with <clears throat> said the coroner we will now hear the witnesses in the natural order gentlemen of the jury by the natural order i mean the order in which the fact connected with the discovery happened our first question will be where and how the body was found next whose the body is for you will remark gentlemen of the jury that at the present moment all we know is that the body of a dead man has been found under exceedingly suspicious circumstances and we must have it identified then we must inquire how he came by his death. If the person who first found the corpse is in court, let him stand forward. A man of somewhat more than six feet high, in a round jacket and oilskin hat, advanced to the table, and gave his evidence in a very clear and intelligent manner, saying, I was standing out upon the sand last night, near upon low water. Where at? asked the coroner. Pray describe the place as accurately as possible why it was just between gull point and our cottages at st martin's replied the boatman and the hour might be about eight or near it the water was not quite out so it must have been about eight i was standing looking out after the french brig which had been making signals like with lights of different colours which i did not understand when all in a minute i heard some one give a sort of loud cry just as if they had been hurt or frightened it came from the land and i heard it quite plain for the wind set off shore and turning round i looked up in the way that the sound seemed to come from was it moonlight asked the coroner lord bless you no sir replied the boatman but the night was not very dark for that matter however as i turned i heard a bit of a row at the top of the cliff and i could see two men standing there close together one a tall man t'other a little shorter and the tall one hit the other twice or three times and then down he came i could see him fall back but after that i lost him for you see sir as he tumbled down the cliff it was darker there when they were atop they had got the sky behind them but when he fell he got into the gloom and i saw no more of him till hearing a cry almost like that of a gull only louder i ran up as hard as i could as I came over the shingle near the cliff, I heard a groan or two, and just below the rock I found the young man, who is in t'other room, lying with his feet to the beach and his head to the cliff. So, you see, he must have turned right over, once at least, as he tumbled. "'What distance were you from the cliff when you saw the two men quarrelling?' asked the coroner. "'It might be a hundred yards or more,' replied the boatman. "'Perhaps two. "'And did you see them clearly?' inquired the officer clear enough to see what they were about answered the fisherman but not to see their faces you have said one was tall the other shorter continued the coroner do you see any one here of the height of the taller one as far as you can judge the man looked round him and it so unfortunately happened that dudley anxious to hear all the evidence had taken a step or two forward the boatman's eyes instantly fell upon him and pointing him out with his hand he said much about that gentleman's height i should think do you mean to say that you think he was the man asked the coroner while a slight frown came over dudley's face no that's another case answered the stout boatman 
all that i could see as they stood and i stood was that the one was taller than the other a good bit and that the tall one knocked the short one over the cliff the three succeeding witnesses were of the same class and profession as the first but they proved nothing more than the finding of the injured man his insensible condition when they came up and his death without having spoken as they carried him to brandon house i think we must have the evidence of sir arthur adelon said the coroner looking towards one of the servants several of whom were in the room pray present my compliments to him and say that i should be glad of his presence for a few moments sir arthur however did not appear immediately and when he entered there was a good deal more agitation in his manner than he could have desired his first act was to shake hands with dudley in a friendly even a warm manner and the coroner rising bowed low to one of the great men of the neighbourhood apologising for troubling him as he called it it is necessary sir arthur he said to make a few inquiries as i am given to understand that the unfortunate young nobleman who met with his death last night in so tragical a manner has been for some days an inmate of your house as well as the gentleman who labours under suspicion as to whether you are aware of any circumstances tending to corroborate the charge any quarrel i mean between the parties or anything likely to produce so fatal a result of nothing in the world replied sir arthur adelon in a frank tone lord hadley and my friend mr dudley have always appeared in my presence at least upon the very best terms what took place yesterday i am not aware of as i was out the greater part of the day until late in the evening having heard very unpleasant rumours which have proved alas too correct and wishing to ascertain the facts and to see what could best be done for the good of the community his eye glanced to dudley's face as he uttered the last somewhat vague and double meaning words but the countenance he looked at remained perfectly calm and firm without the slightest perceptible change of expression then you have no cause sir arthur inquired the coroner to suppose mr dudley at all implicated in this transaction from my own personal knowledge none in the world answered the baronet there are always rumours afloat after deeds are done but if my deliberate opinion could have any weight i should say that mr dudley is perfectly incapable of intentionally injuring any man that he would do much to save or serve a fellow-creature i believe but nothing to wrong or aggrieve one high testimony said the coroner in a pompous tone i am much obliged sir arthur and looking at a slip of paper which he held in his hand he pronounced the name of patrick ferrers the butler at brandon house immediately stood forward and without much questioning made a deposition somewhat to the following effect i knew the late lord hadley i have known him since he has been at brandon house he was the same gentleman whose body now lies in the dining-room he was here about ten days before he met with his death i know also the prisoner mr dudley i never saw any quarrel between them till yesterday when mr dudley and lord hadley came home about the same time together and mr dudley insisted on speaking in private with lord hadley mr dudley seemed a little cross and they went into this room together i went in the meantime to fetch some letters which had been brought while they were out when i came back i saw lord hadley coming out of the library seemingly in a great passion he shook his fist at mr dudley and seemed to be using very hard words which i did not hear mr dudley was then a step or two behind him but he seemed very angry too though not so angry as his lordship and i could hear every word he said though perhaps i cannot recollect them exactly now but i know that they were something like you had better take care what you say of me my lord for if you treat me disrespectfully i will punish you depend upon it the coroner looked towards mr dudley who observed in a quiet tone the words were not exactly those but the meaning is given with sufficient accuracy go on said the coroner did you observe anything of a similar nature during the rest of the day after about an hour continued the butler lord hadley went out again mr dudley followed him and i heard the gamekeeper say we must have nothing upon hearsay exclaimed the coroner the gamekeeper i dare say can answer for himself speak to what is within your own knowledge when mr dudley came back i was in the hall the porter let him in but we both remarked that he looked a deal ruffled 
at dinner he and lord hadley seemed very cool and snappish to each other and immediately after dinner mr dudley went out and lord hadley went after him asking brown the head footman which way the other gentleman had gone i heard him myself so that i can speak to and that is the last i saw or heard of either of them till his lordship's body was brought in last night and mr dudley came here this morning john brown said the coroner and the head footman stood forward he corroborated the greater part of the butler's testimony and added but little else except an expression of his own opinion that the young lord and mr dudley had been out of sorts with each other as he termed it all the preceding day the gamekeeper was then brought forward and stated that he was just walking away from the house after having been out with mr dudley and mr adelon during the whole morning when the former came up to him with a quick step asked which way the young nobleman had taken and followed him as fast as he could go the man and woman at the lodge were then called and proved that a little before eight on the preceding night they were standing together at the door of their cottage when the young peer and mr dudley passed out of the park the man said that they were talking very angrily and the woman that they were speaking very quick but she remembered hearing mr dudley say such conduct is most reprehensible my lord and will receive chastisement sooner or later both she and her husband deposed that the young peer and mr dudley took their way towards the downs and a labourer stated that he had seen two gentlemen going in the same direction one of whom was tall like the prisoner and the other somewhat shorter they were then speaking quick and sharp he said and one of them was tossing his arms about a good deal a pause for a moment or two succeeded and then the coroner raised his voice saying is there any one else who can give evidence in this case let it be recollected that it is the bounden duty of all men when a crime has been committed to assist in bringing the criminal to justice please your worship said a tall raw-boned man coming forward towards the table i think i can say a word or two if you would be kind enough to hear me we are here to listen to every one who can speak to any facts connected with the death of the unfortunate young nobleman whose body has been lately viewed by the jury was the coroner's reply speak to facts without entering into hearsay my good man and in the first place tell us what is your name and occupation i am a labourer by trade and my name is daniel connor answered the witness as to facts it's just them i've got to speak about for i suppose i am the only man except the boatman who saw the thing done i was just taking a walk quietly upon the downs above st martin's when i saw the young lord i've seen him many a time before down at mr clive's farm come walking along very dully like i saw him quite well though he didn't see me for he was walking along the road in the little dell and i was sitting down above why i thought you said you were walking said the coroner to be sure i was answered daniel connor sorrow a thing else i was taking a walk and sitting down your worship as many a man does i believe was there any one else with lord hadley asked the coroner that i can't just say answered connor there was nobody close to him or i should have seen them both at once and there might be somebody not far off as indeed there was but you see your worship i leaned back upon the turf for i didn't want to be disturbed in my meditations ah said the coroner go on my man well a minute after it might be two minutes perhaps for i won't be particular as to that i heard two men quarrelling and looking up to the sky i saw them clear enough what in the sky said the coroner no again it replied the witness for both their feet were upon the ground at that time but just at the edge of the cliff where there's a bit of a rail they were hitting each other about and being a peaceable man anyhow having had enough of rows in my own country that's ireland your worship i sat quite still and then one gave the other a great knock and away he went backing over the rail and so i walked quietly home and saw no one be so good as to describe the man who struck the other and knocked him over the cliff said the coroner why that's mighty difficult to do answered daniel connor seeing that they were fifty yards off and more and looked just like two black shadows on the wall did you ever see him before demanded the crown officer somewhat impatiently maybe i have answered the witness but i should not just like to say for certain but you had no doubt in the case of lord hadley 
rejoined the coroner. "'That was natural-like,' answered Daniel Connor, "'for he came within ten yards of me, "'and t'other was a good bit farther off when I saw him.' "'Let me try, Mr. Coroner,' said the foreman of the jury. "'Was he a tall man or a short man, witness?' "'Oh, it was a tall man he was,' replied Coroner. "'I dare say an inch taller than I am, and I'm no bantam. "'Did you ever see that gentleman before?' continued the foreman pointing out dudley i think i have your honour answered the witness was he the man you saw strike lord hadley on the cliff demanded the coroner in a stern tone i shouldn't just like to swear answered daniel connor but he's not unlike him anyhow for the first time a sense of danger reached dudley's bosom and stepping forward at once he placed himself directly before the witness and gazed sternly in his face an impression a feeling without any apparent cause and which he could not account for himself, took possession of him, that the man was wilfully giving untrue evidence. But his severe searching look had no effect upon the mind of Daniel Connor. It was under a more powerful influence, and though in reality by no means a bad or malicious man, yet relying upon the assurances of the priest, he looked upon the matter between Dudley and himself rather as a game that they were playing than anything else and the same shrewd momentary smile passed over his countenance, which had once crossed it while conversing with the priest during the preceding night. He gave a glance at the prisoner's face, and in answer, as it seemed, to his gaze, he said, "'Aye, yes, sir, you are mighty like him, anyhow, but I should not just like to swear.' "'Will you allow me, sir, to ask this man some questions?' asked Dudley, addressing the coroner. "'Undoubtedly.' replied that officer and the jury will be very happy to hear any explanation you may have to give regarding this affair now answer me truly said dudley what were you doing upon the downs at that hour of the night just taking a walk your honour replied the man and what had you been engaged in all day demanded dudley i have been ploughing all the morning from daylight till dinner time answered connor and after that i've been doing a many little jobs about the farm "'And yet after that you went to take a long walk over the downs,' said Dudley. "'Now will you swear that Lord Hadley did not come up the road you mention alone?' "'No, I won't swear that,' replied Connor, for I did not see. "'He was alone, sure enough, when I first set eyes upon him. "'But you see, Your Honour, someone must have been very near him for a minute or two after. "'Someone pitched him over the cliff.' "'Was he walking fast or slow?' asked Dudley. "'Mighty slow, considering that it was a cold night,' answered the witness. "'And yet you thought fit to sit down and meditate on that cold night,' remarked Dudley. "'Did you hear any words spoken between the young nobleman and the man who killed him?' "'Oh, aye, there was plenty of talk,' replied Connor. "'But I didn't hear what they said.' "'Now you have said that you knew Lord Hadley at once,' continued Dudley. "'It was a dark night, and he was down in a road below you, you assert.' and yet you declare that you cannot be sure of who was the man who afterwards struck him, though they were then both clear out against the blue sky. "'I didn't say I wasn't sure,' answered the witness somewhat maliciously. "'I may be sure enough, and yet not like to swear, Your Honour." Dudley asked several other questions, but they were to no purpose, or only served to confirm the impression already produced. He himself felt that it was so and with a slight touch of that eager impatience which had once been strong in his disposition, before adversity had tamed it, he exclaimed, turning towards the jury, "'I know not, gentlemen, what is this man's object. Perhaps, indeed, I ought not to assume that he has any object, but all his words are evidently calculated to give you a false view of the case. As has been sworn by other persons, I did go out yesterday, immediately after dinner. I was joined by Lord Hadley, there was some discussion between us as we walked along but it was not of so angry character as that of the morning and allow me to say that the dispute between us was entirely as between tutor and pupil i found it necessary to reprehend some part of lord hadley's conduct and he being very nearly of age angrily resisted all authority and refused to listen to my counsel as we walked along together last night although there were occasional bursts of passion on his part i thought that my arguments had produced some effect and we parted at a spot where the high road towards barhampton is traversed by the path leading from clive grange over the downs and through the break in the hills to the seashore he was then calm though somewhat gloomy and i walked on 
nearly to barhampton where i was a witness to a very serious riot i returned immediately to brandon and was seized in the avenue by two constables who refused to give me any information farther than merely showing their warrant i call god to witness that i never saw lord hadley after we parted at the cross-road this is all i have to say and the only explanation of my conduct that can be given perhaps sir you will give the goodness to inform us what it was that took you to barhampton at so late an hour said the coroner sir arthur adelon who had been standing near the table drew back and walked towards the end of the room as if about to quit it but paused amongst the crowd before he reached the door dudley remarked the movement of apprehension but he was resolved not to betray him on any account and he replied after a moment's pause i went on private business sir a curious hour to transact business said the coroner can you not explain the nature of it even in general terms in a certain degree i have no objection replied dudley it related to some papers belonging to my father and i wished to say a few words upon the subject to a gentleman whom it was necessary for me to see that night i had no means of seeing him at an earlier hour or in every respect i should have preferred it the coroner paused thoughtfully for a moment or two and then asked have you anything to add sir dudley signified that he had not and the room was ordered to be cleared as soon as the coroner was alone with his jury he addressed them in a somewhat long and florid speech being a man rather fond of his own eloquence his observations in regard to the general duties of persons in their situation may be spared the reader but after having discussed that topic for some time he proceeded to comment upon the evidence it is proved he said that mr dudley and the unfortunate young nobleman had been upon bad terms during the whole of that day and that they had quarrelled and used threatening language to each other and that they continued in dispute till the last moment they were seen together i do not wish to make the case worse than it is gentlemen of the jury or to say that mr dudley went out with any evil intentions towards his pupil there is no animus shown and it must be recollected that he went out first and his lordship followed but i do not mean to say we have it clearly before us that they were both in that state of mind which rendered a quarrel of the most serious description even to acts of violence extremely probable then we traced them together for some way on the road to the very spot where the fatal occurrence took place even by mr dudley's account not many minutes could have elapsed between the time at which he says they parted and the time when lord hadley met with his death hardly time enough for the young nobleman to have met and quarrelled with another man then we have the evidence of the fisherman or boatman and the evidence of the labourer daniel connor each account confirming the other the one says that the fatal blow was struck by a tall man such as you have seen mr dudley is the other that the person who was quarrelled with and ultimately killed lord hadley was a tall man very much like mr dudley though from the darkness of the night he will not absolutely swear to him now gentlemen this is a very conclusive train of evidence taken by itself but let us examine mr dudley's own statement he admits all the previous facts the quarrelling in the morning the going out at night the being followed by lord hadley their walk together towards the very spot and their arrival at a place which as far as my recollection serves is only a few hundred yards from the scene of the tragedy mr dudley indeed says that he there left lord hadley and walked on towards barhampton upon business of which he will give no distinct account doubtless he might walk to barhampton and that he did go somewhere is very clear for he did not return to brandon park we are informed till about midnight but it is just as probable as not that he should wander about for some time after committing such an act as certainly was perpetrated by some one that he did so is not the slightest presumption of innocence but rather perhaps the contrary then again we have to consider the conduct of lord hadley and to ask ourselves was it probable that after parting with mr dudley he should go on in a cold unpleasant night to stroll upon the downs without as far as we know any object whatsoever it is evident that when he last went out from this house he followed his tutor to speak with him on the same painful subjects which had led to such severe quarrels in the morning when their discussion was at an end it would seem much more likely that he should return to brandon house where a pleasant family party was waiting his return 
such would probably have been his conduct if mr dudley's statements were correct but does it not naturally suggest itself to your minds as much more likely that the dispute was carried on vehemently between the two gentlemen that the young nobleman took the path over the downs followed at some short distance by his tutor that more irritating words passed when they reached the top of the cliff and that the fatal blow was struck which hurried the young nobleman into eternity it is for you gentlemen of the jury to consider all these facts and to decide upon your verdict if you judge that the hand of mr dudley did really slay the young nobleman the manner of whose death is the subject of inquiry you will have to choose between two courses if you believe mr dudley entertained a premeditated design to kill his pupil of which i confess i see no trace in the evidence you will bring in a verdict of wilful murder if on the contrary you think that the act was committed in a moment of hasty passion for remark the fact of the blow not having been intended to produce death is no justification you will then bring in a verdict of manslaughter and whatever view you take you will remember that this is only a preliminary inquiry and that the person upon whom suspicion falls will have the opportunity at an after period of bringing forward any evidence he pleases to prove his innocence the jury took very little time to deliberate they were most of them sensible men in a respectable station of life perhaps a little too easily bent by the opinions of a superior but even had not the coroner's own view of the case been so evident they probably would have come to the same decision after a few words had passed between them to ascertain that they were all of one mind their foreman returned a verdict of manslaughter against edward dudley End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the convict by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one when dudley was taken out of the library where the coroner's jury sat he was surrounded in the hall by several persons all eager to have some conversation with him mr conway the magistrate who had signed the warrant for his apprehension spoke to him in a good-humoured way expressing his sorrow that he had been called upon to perform so unpleasant a duty dudley bowed stiffly but did not reply for he was neither pleased with the act nor the apology but he was immediately succeeded by another magistrate who with as much kindness and more judgment pressed him to call every little particular of his walk on the preceding night to his mind to put them down while they were still fresh in his memory and to try to recollect every one he had seen or spoken with between the period of his quitting brandon and his return in order to prepare an unbroken chain of evidence for his defence i have known a man's life saved he said by keeping a note-book in which he wrote down at night everything that had occurred to him during the day dudley thanked him for his suggestions and felt that he did not believe him guilty but at the same time he perceived very clearly that the magistrate concluded the coroner's jury would give a verdict against him almost at the same moment sir arthur adelon came up and with a very peculiar expression of countenance pressed his hand but without speaking the next moment edgar came in from the park through the glass doors his whole appearance betrayed great agitation his eye was flashing his cheek flushed and there was a nervous excitable quivering of his lip as he approached dudley which told how much he was moved he wrung the prisoner's hand hard with a swimming moisture in his eyes which he seemed ashamed of but his tongue failed him when he tried to speak and all he could say was oh dudley you do not think me guilty i am sure my young friend said dudley guilty cried edgar guilty oh no no guilty of nothing but of too high and noble a heart i have been out all the morning since i heard of this dreadful affair seeking for evidence all the way you went but i have been able to find none which way did you take after you passed the lodge it matters not edgar at present answered dudley many thanks for your kindness but all that must be thought of hereafter i can easily see how these good gentlemen will decide and i must have counsel down 
from london who will gather together the necessary testimony to prove my innocence of an act i never even dreamed of i shall call upon your kindness i dare say edgar in the course of this affair believe me my dear sir said sir arthur adelon nothing shall be wanting on my part to give you every assistance i need not tell you that as i said before the jury i am fully and entirely convinced of your innocence and shall ever remain so being certain from what i know of your character that you are quite incapable of committing such an act even in a moment of anger let me add my assurance also mr dudley said the priest approaching with his quiet step you are not a man to give way to hasty bursts of passion i trust not mr filmer replied dudley and on the present occasion there was no provocation in the morning indeed lord hadley used very intemperate language towards me but at night though he had evidently drunk more wine than was wise yet as i have often remarked with him before the effect was to render him more placable and good-humoured showing that he was not bad at heart said mr conway in vino veritas mr dudley i do not think he was bad at heart by any means replied dudley prosperity and weakness of character ought to bear many of the sins which are laid upon the shoulders of a bad disposition i trust sir arthur he continued you will have the kindness to break this sad event to poor lady hadley who although she has thank heaven other children to console her will feel her loss most bitterly some farther conversation of the same kind took place during which the same little crowd continued round the prisoner while edgar adelon kept his place close to dudley's side with a look of impatience and anxiety which led the latter to believe that his young friend had something of importance to communicate it was by this time about half-past nine the usual breakfast hour at brandon house and the spot where dudley stood was directly opposite the foot of the great staircase the two constables were close behind him and as i said before the magistrates and others who had been present at the inquest as spectators had remained around him in the hall not expecting that the coroner's address to his jury would be so tediously long as it proved they're a long time in finding their verdict said one of the magistrates and as he spoke edgar adelon crossed over to his father and said would it not be better that we should wait in your justice room eda will be down directly depend upon it i forgot i forgot said his father i had better go and communicate to her what has taken place does she not know asked dudley nothing nothing replied the baronet and was advancing towards the stairs but he was too late for miss brandon had turned the first flight from her own room before he reached the foot she paused for an instant seeing such a number of people in the hall but the next moment she proceeded with a look of apprehension for the sight at once awakened fears in regard to her uncle though she had been assured before she retired to rest the night preceding that sir arthur had returned safe and well the baronet advanced to meet her and dudley yielding to the impulse of his heart took a step or two forward to say a few words the last perhaps he might be able to speak to her for some months eda's eyes were fixed upon him as she came down the last two steps but ere he could reach her the head constable caught him rudely by the collar exclaiming come come master i mustn't lose hold o ye seeing as how this is a case of murder eda gazed wildly in dudley's face for an instant and then dropped fainting on the floor of the hall look to her edgar look to her edgar said dudley in a low voice do not let her alarm herself so tell her for heaven's sake that the charge is false nay absurd a number of persons ran forward to assist miss brandon and carried her into the breakfast-room at the same moment the door of the library opened and the constables were ordered to bring in the prisoner they hurried him in without ceremony and he found the jury still seated round the table and the coroner on his feet with a written paper in his hand the verdict of the jury he said aloud is manslaughter against edward dudley esq constables i have here made out a warrant for the committal of that gentleman to the county jail 
but of course if the magistrates who ordered his apprehension think fit to proceed with their own separate investigation of the case it will be your duty to consult their convenience as to the time of his removal and i will add that you are bound to put him to no unnecessary inconvenience consistent with his safe custody a course which i must say you do not seem to have followed hitherto the chief constable held down his head with a dogged look but without reply and mr conway standing forward addressed the coroner saying i as the magistrate who issued the warrant do not see any necessity sir for taking this matter at all out of the hands of your court the case has undergone here a very minute and well-conducted investigation and i do not think anything could be added which may not quite as well be brought forward at the assizes the two gentlemen bowed to each other with mutual polite speeches and dudley was removed in custody of the two officers a pack of fools murmured edgar adelon in no very inaudible tone and following dudley out of the room he crossed the hall to the breakfast-room when the constables seemed somewhat puzzled how to proceed with their prisoner the next moment however edgar returned with his father who advanced direct towards dudley saying i grieve very much mr dudley that the jury have thought fit to come to this conclusion but you must use my carriage over to blank and as i am one of the visiting magistrates i will take care that the short residence which you must submit to in a prison shall be rendered as little inconvenient to you as possible dudley thanked him for his kindness took leave of edgar and in a few minutes was rolling away to a town at the distance of about sixteen miles with one constable by his side and the other on the box the first reflections of the prisoner were naturally not very pleasant but those which succeeded were still less agreeable a hard fate seemed to pursue him born to station affluence and ease he had set out in life filled with bright hopes and eager expectations the sparkling cup of youth had seemed replete with pleasant drops of every kind and he had little dreamed while such bright things appeared upon the surface that there was such a bitter draught below he had indulged in many a wild and ardent fancy and sated if not spoiled by the cup of success had longed as every young man has longed for change for new pleasures for pursuits opposite to those which he had followed for enjoyments differing in their novelty to the joys which he had tasted ah little does one know in youth when we seek a change of condition what it is we pray for even if that very alteration which we desire is granted to us we find it loaded with evils unforeseen with inherent cares and anxieties which we had never perceived with consequences destructive of all our bright expectations but how often does it happen that when pampered happiness seeks mere abstract change from satiated appetite and the desire of fresh enjoyment the chastening hand on high sends bitter reverses to teach us the value of the blessings we despised and to lead us to that humble thankfulness which is rarely to be found in the ungrateful heart of prosperity adverse fortune has fallen upon him early and coming to a strong and thoughtful mind had produced the full fruits of the wholesome lesson fortune and all that fortune gives had been lost and even the society of a wise and affectionate parent had been taken away he had had to soothe the departing hours of a beloved father through a long sickness he had had to struggle with difficulties and to undertake labours never contemplated at the outset of his career and now when both love and fortune smiled upon him for an instant again like a gleam of sunshine through a stormy cloud the light seemed snatched away as soon as given the flame of hope extinguished as soon as kindled but he had felt and acknowledged the uses of adversity and although with the natural superstition which is in every man's heart which led men in ancient and even some in modern times to believe in the ascendancy of a propitious or unpropitious star he had first felt inclined to suppose that his evil fortunes dogged him as a destiny from which he could not fly yet reason and religion taught him that the sorrows which are sent by the almighty are ordained in mercy and in the end he said 
this may be salutary too the first fruit of true christian resignation is exertion and giving up all useless ponderings upon the past as he rode along he turned to provide against the future but strange to say his thoughts became more gloomy as he did so he tried to collect and arrange in his mind all the evidence he could bring forward in his defence but with a feeling of pain and apprehension to which he had never before given way he perceived nothing that he could add at the assizes to that which had been brought forward before the coroner's jury he had seen nobody from the moment when lord hadley quitted him till he came upon the men on watch at mead's farm of these he knew not one even by name and he was too clear-sighted not to perceive even in his own case that his having met them some time afterwards was no proof whatever that he had not committed previously the act with which he was charged to show an object in going out at that late hour of the evening might indeed have some effect but yet he felt it would be impossible with a regard to his own honour for so small an advantage to betray the confidence which had been placed in him and to ruin sir arthur adelon with very little benefit to himself one slight probability indeed in his favour might be raised by his proving the cause of the angry discussions which had taken place between himself and lord hadley and yet he felt a repugnance either to cast an imputation upon the dead or to bring forward the name of helen clive under such circumstances he did not indeed entertain such romantic notions of honour and chivalrous courtesy as to think that it would be unjustifiable to do either if his own safety absolutely depended upon it but he resolved in the first place to consult his counsel as to whether it was necessary and then to send a message to mr clive telling him that such was the case with that exception he had nothing to add to what he had already said and although it would tell in his favour to show that the dispute between himself and his pupil was honourable to himself and showed a mind not likely to commit a crime yet he saw very clearly that it was no distinct evidence of innocence all these thoughts occupied him long his companion though more civil than before was dull and gloomy and dudley was still meditating on his course when the first houses of a town came in view and then a large stone building with emblematic fetters over the gate and in two minutes more he was within the walls of a prison End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the convict by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two there were two persons in brandon house who suffered deeply on the morning when dudley was carried away to prison and each mistakenly encouraged some degree of self-reproach such as none but delicate minds can feel for having unwittingly and unwillingly placed one they loved in a dangerous and painful position eda brandon thought had i not taxed his generosity to forgive uninquiringly injuries of which he knew not the extent and to go forth to save from disgrace and danger the very man who had inflicted them this false charge could never have been brought edgar adelon said to himself if i had not communicated to him all my suspicions regarding the conduct of this young reptile lord towards my sweet helen he would not in a fit of generous indignation have done that which has brought him into peril and sorrow oh that i had had any other friend at hand to consult upon the conduct i should pursue oh that helen telling me all had justified me in driving forth the viper from my cousin's house oh that father peter had not withheld the tale of all the insults that she suffered till it was too late for me to act and another had punished the offender as i ought to have done such thoughts passed through his mind about two hours after dudley's removal from brandon and while eda was still in her own room to which she had been carried as soon as the house had resumed its usual state mr filmer and sir arthur adelon were closeted in the library and the only apparent result of their conversation as yet had been an order for one of the grooms to ride as fast as possible to barhampton 
and bring four post-horses to carry the baronet on his way to London. "'What can I do? How can I act?' Edgar Adelon asked himself. "'I must have someone to consult with, and I know not whom. I do not believe my father loves Dudley in his heart. I have seen him eye him with an expression of dislike, and I will not trust the priest. Good man as he is, his policy is always a subtle one. It is a pity that, with those Italians, amongst whom he lived so long, he acquired that covert and indirect mode of dealing. His purposes and ends are always right, I do believe, too right and honest to be sought by crooked means. I must talk with Eda. She is candour and truth itself, and yet has wit enough to put all Filmer's arts at fault. I will talk with her and with his usual hasty action he was going at once to put his purpose in execution when he heard his father come out of the library go up the stairs and knock at his cousin's door sir arthur remained long with his niece and edgar who remained in the room below for some time thought he heard his father's voice sometimes raised higher than usual at other times however it sounded with a low murmur as if holding a long and earnest argument the young man grew impatient at length, and going forth into the park he wandered about for nearly an hour, and when he returned found Sir Arthur's post-chariot at the door, ready to bear him away. "'Your father has been waiting for you, Mr. Adelon,' said the butler. "'He is in the breakfast-room.' And Edgar immediately directed his steps thither, without asking any questions. "'Why, Edgar, did you not know I was going?' demanded the baronet as soon as his son appeared. And then, without waiting for a reply, he proceeded, "'It is necessary for me, my dear boy, to go up to London at once to break the sad intelligence of Lord Hadley's death to his poor mother. In the meantime, I think it will be better for you, more decent, more proper, to meddle as little as possible in the affairs of a gentleman charged with having produced his death, at least till after he has had a fair trial, and is acquitted or found guilty.' I have some other business of importance to transact in London, but I trust to be down in time to be present at the funeral, if it is to be performed here. Mr. Filmer will make all the necessary arrangements, according to the directions he will receive. Edgar Adelon was, like most young men, somewhat wrong-headed. His disposition was too firm and generous for him to be spoiled, as it is usually called, but he had been very much indulged and usually took his own way. He never, indeed, showed the least want of respect towards his father, in word or manner, but he generally followed the course which suited him best, with less reverence in his actions than in his deportment. On the present occasion, then, he made no reply, but remained determined to do everything he could for Dudley, notwithstanding all opposition. After a few more words from Sir Arthur, Edgar accompanied his father to the door of the carriage, took leave of him, and then at once mounted the stairs to Eda's room, and knocked at the door. "'Go into my little sitting-room, Edgar,' said Eda, who knew his step, "'and I will come to you directly. I wish much to speak to you, my dear cousin.' But Eda kept him some time waiting, and when she came at length, Edgar saw that tears had been late visitants in her eyes." "'Do not grieve, Eda, dear,' said Edgar, taking her hand kindly. "'This will all pass away. "'But let you and I sit down together and consult what can best be done for poor Dudley. "'He will be acquitted to a certainty, I think. "'Nay, I am sure.' "'I do not know, Edgar,' answered Eda. "'But in the meantime we must do all we can to help and comfort him, "'and that is why I wished to speak with you so much.' "'for I know no one but you who seem to love him here.' "'Oh, yes, there is one other, Eda,' answered Edgar, with a smile. "'One who loves him very well, I think.' The colour rose in Eda's cheek, but she raised her eyes to his, answering at once, "'There certainly is, Edgar, and I have just told your father so. "'I avow it, Edgar, the more frankly, because it is necessary.' if we really would serve him, to have no concealments from each other. We have jested and laughed over such things, Edgar, but now it is necessary that we should speak plainly, both of your situation and mine. First, then, tell me what my father said, answered Edgar. I promise you, Eda, dear, I will have no concealments from you now. You are a sweet, 
kind affectionate girl as ever lived and you have neither pride nor prejudices which should make me afraid to tell you all my own feelings let me hear what my father answered when you told him of dudley's love and what you said to him again he said much edgar that was very unpleasant replied eda but do not let me dwell upon it he found me firmer than he expected and he is now fully aware of my intentions and moreover aware that he can never change them at least i hope so for what i said should leave no doubt but now to other matters i think you have a sincere affection for dudley is it not so i would lay down my life for him answered edgar adelon but when i said that there was another who loved him well too i did not altogether mean you eda but i meant mr filmer eda waved her hand and shook her head your religious feelings blind you edgar she said mr filmer does not love him never has loved him there was a peculiar look came into his face the very first moment he saw dudley here which you did not remark but which i did and which i have remarked more than once before when any one whom he hates approaches him it is but for a moment but it is very distinct and moreover i have seldom seen any one call up that look who has not somehow fallen into misfortune do you remember the farmer hadyer upon your father's estate in yorkshire and how after being in very prosperous circumstances he was soon totally ruined well the first time i saw the poor man come up to speak to your father when mr filmer was present that look came into the priest's face nay it is you are prejudiced eda replied her cousin what offence could poor hadyer have given to father peter and how was he instrumental in his ruin his wife had been a catholic and became a protestant the year before answered eda how his ruin was brought about i do not know but i heard mr filmer dissuade your father from granting what hadyer asked and which seemed to me but just and equitable he said nothing in the man's presence but when he was gone and he found your father was inclined to accede he urged that if your father granted the remission of half a year's rent to one farmer on account of the flood which carried away double the value of corn he would have some such accidents happening to some of the tenants every year but all this is irrelevant mr filmer loves him not of that i am quite sure we must seek other counsel edgar and find means to prove dudley's innocence there is one i think who can supply it if she will and you must go to her and seek it for if i am not mistaken and eda smiled as she fixed her eyes upon him your voice will be more powerful with her than that of any other human being you mean dear helen clive replied edgar eda you have made your confession and mine is soon made helen clive shall be my wife whatever obstacles may stand in the way she too would if she could i am sure show sufficient justification for what dudley did it was on an act of righteous vengeance upon as base a man as ever breathed what do you mean edgar exclaimed eda brandon gazing at him as he spoke with a flushed cheek and flashing eye you do not really believe that dudley did kill this unhappy young man i do eda answered her cousin but listen to me and he proceeded to tell her all he knew and it was but a part of lord hadley's conduct to helen clive he spoke too of how he had himself on the preceding morning informed dudley of the facts acknowledged his own love for helen and asked the advice of his friend as to the course he ought to pursue he soothed comforted calmed me eda continued the young man and in the end told me to leave the affair in his hands and he would take care that my own dear gentle helen should be insulted no more from the evidence given by the servants it is clear that dudley and the other had a bitter quarrel upon this very theme that the wrongdoer was insolent in his wrong and provoked his monitor more than patience could endure dudley is by nature fiery and impetuous either and depend upon it they met last night this base peer provoked his nobler friend and dudley struck a blow which though unintentionally punished him as he deserved eda mused sadly for a moment but she then replied 
no edgar no your father told me that dudley solemnly denied the act were it as you say he would not have done so impetuous he may be but most decided in right and truth he is and always has been he would have told the tale of what had happened as it did happen the act and the motive would have stood forth clear together and he would have left the rest to fate and besides i know he did not do it he went out at my request on business which nothing i am sure would have turned him from the dinner was somewhat late the hour named fast approaching and i could see his anxiety to go he would not i know have gone ten steps out of his way at that moment on any account whatever no edgar he did not do it and helen perhaps may help us to the proofs for she must know who the men were that dudley was to meet near mead's farm there were others about too i am sure and by their testimony we may perhaps show step by step every yard of the way that dudley took go to her edgar go at once why do you shake your head because dear eda helen is no longer within reach replied edgar adelon she embarked last night with her father who was implicated in this mad rising and attempt upon barhampton eda sat speechless with surprise and consternation her hope of proving dudley's innocence had been based entirely upon the information which could be given by helen clive and now to find that she was gone and evidently to a distance too seemed to strike her with despair from her uncle and from the servants she had gleaned a very accurate idea of all the evidence which had been given before the coroner's jury and she had seen from the first the difficulties of her lover's situation with far more alarm than he himself had felt but her mind was quick and intelligent and turned after a temporary pause of consternation to consider what was best next to be done fear not eda dear continued edgar seeing the expression of alarm upon her face i must soon hear where helen is she has promised to write to me whenever she arrives in france and to let me know where she is to be found at all events the priest must know stay stay edgar said eda helen's evidence would be too late my uncle tells me the assizes will be held in ten days and you must trust mr filmer in nothing edgar you think i am prejudiced but it is not so i know him my dear cousin but there is another way if we could but find a person named norris he might assist us why that was the very leader of these men said edgar somewhat sharply i heard him myself harangue them two nights ago on the little green before the old priory and he used my father's name in a false and shameless manner alas in a too true manner edgar answered eda i must tell you all now edgar for dudley must not be sacrificed his object in going out that night was to save my uncle from participating in acts that may bring ruin on his head whether he succeeded in persuading him to desist or not i do not know for i did not dare to ask your father but be assured edgar that up to eight o'clock last night it was sir arthur's intention to be present with if not lead the people who attacked barhampton it was i who urged dudley to go but what could he do demanded edgar you know my father in such circumstances attends to no advice true answered eda but dudley had a power over him edgar and she proceeded to explain all that she herself knew of the dark transactions in which sir arthur adelon had been engaged in former years she put it gently and kindly not as an accusation but as an unfortunate fact and she told how generously dudley had promised at once when he heard the means norris had employed to urge her uncle forward on so fatal a course that he would assure sir arthur on his word of honour to destroy the papers spoken of without even looking at them edgar's cheek at first flushed and then turned pale and in the end he covered his eyes with his hands and remained buried in thought helen told me continued eda willing to lead his mind away from the more painful part of the subject that whoever i sent to seek my uncle will find some men waiting near the place called mead's farm there were watches she told along the whole line of road and some of them surely saw dudley pass 
At all events, Norris can give information, if anyone, and the only difficulty will be to find him. "'I will find him,' cried Edgar Adelon, starting up. "'But then,' he added, "'perhaps he may have left the country, too. "'I will seek him, however, let him be where he will, "'and find him, if it be in human power to do so, "'for Dudley shall not suffer for his noble and generous devotion.' "'But let us consider, Edgar, how Norris can best be heard of,' said Eda. "'But Edgar waved his hand with that bright, happy thing.' the smile of youthful confidence upon his face, and answered, "'I will find him, dear girl. I will find him. I know several of the men who were with him. I recognise their faces at the priory. But I will about it at once, for there is no time to be lost.'" End of chapter 22"'Chapter 23 of The Convict by G. P. R. James. "'This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. "'Chapter 23. "'It was a dark and stormy night when Edgar Adelon, "'mounted upon a powerful horse, "'which seemed wearied with long travel, "'rode along towards a little village near the sea-coast, "'about twelve miles from Brandon. "'The rain beat hard upon him, dashing in his fair face, "'and almost blinding man and steed.' The wind tossed about the curls of his hair like streamers round his head. Neither great coat nor cloak sheltered his delicate form from the blast or the downpouring deluge, but still he spurred on, seeming heedless of the tempest that raged around. He entered the street of the village. He passed the little alehouse, where there were lights and laughing voices within, and he drew not a rein till he reached the last cottage but one, upon the right-hand side before which he checked his horse suddenly and sprang to the ground fastening the bridle round the paling he went forward and knocked at the door and then immediately lifted the latch and went in saying martin oldkirk lives here i believe a short square-built vigorous-looking man rose from the fireside and eyed him with a suspicious look as he entered he had been reading a sort of newspaper, small in size and apparently badly printed, by the light of a single tallow candle, but he instantly put the paper away and shaded his eyes to examine the visitor. "'Yes,' he said at length, "'my name is Martin Oldkirk. What do you want with me?' "'I want to speak a few words with you,' answered Edgar Adelon, closing the door behind him and advancing to the table. "'You know a gentleman of the name of Norris, I believe?' The man hesitated, and then replied, "'I have seen such a person, I've a notion. "'He called here once, but that's all.' "'You know me, however, I suppose,' answered Edgar Adelon. "'Yes, I think I have seen you before somewhere,' replied Old Kirk, with an indifferent air. "'You are the baronet's son over at Brandon, I fancy.' exactly so replied the young gentleman and harry graves who works for mr mead told me that you could give me some information what about demanded the man abruptly about this very mr norris answered edgar adelon fixing his eyes upon him i have been eight days hunting him and find at last that you are the only man who knows where he is that's a lie at least "'answered the man in an insolent and swaggering tone, "'and you may tell Harry Graves so for me.' "'Edgar smothered his indignation at his companion's brutality, "'and replied, "'At all events you know where he is to be found, "'and you must tell me where he is, "'for I must speak to him immediately upon business of importance.' "'You won't hear from me,' answered the man, "'for mayhap I do not know where he is. "'If you want him, you must find him for yourself.' No said edgar sternly you must find him for me or if you don't you must take the consequences and what may they be asked the labourer with no less insolence in his manner but with a contemptuous smile curling his lip at the same time why simply that i shall give you up to justice answered edgar adelon as one of the rioters who treasonably attacked the town of barhampton you would find that difficult to prove answered the man because i was not there not as difficult as you imagine answered the young gentleman 
i have the written testimony of three witnesses to show that you were present and if you do not do what i require depend upon it i will use those means to convict you the man had taken two steps round the table and he now sprang at once between edgar and the door exclaiming then to me if i don't knock your brains out for your pains i'm not to be bullied in that way as he spoke he was advancing upon the young gentleman but when he was within not much more than two yards edgar suddenly drew a pistol from between his waistcoat and his shirt where he had put it to keep dry and presented it at oldkirk cocking it at the same time with a loud click i came prepared for all that he said with a bitter smile they told me you were a desperate fellow and that they were all afraid to come near you take another step and you are a dead man martin oldkirk paused and gazed at him with a look in which a certain portion of admiration was joined with surprise upon my life he said at length you're a brave little devil but this is hardly fair sir now let us sit down and talk over the matter i see what stuff you're made of and i don't think you'd do what's wrong or wish me to do so either well keep your distance then said edgar adelon you are a stronger man than i am and the pistol only puts us on a level as to wishing you to do what's wrong i have no such desires nor intention i wish you to do what is right and that i will show you in a minute oldkirk retreated to his former station and waited without reply for edgar adelon to go on you have heard me request you said the young gentleman seating himself opposite to him to tell show or lead me to the place where mr norris lies concealed now i have not the slightest intention whatsoever of injuring that gentleman in any way no consideration would induce me to betray him and i give you my word of honour that his secret shall be as safe with me as it is with you why upon second thoughts replied the peasant i should guess it would seeing that that which hurts him might hurt your own father mr adelon and mayhap it's about your father's affairs that you are going to speak with him edgar shut his lips tight and after a moment's pause replied i know nothing of my father's affairs mr oldkirk and i will not deceive you about it my business with mr norris has no connection with my father whatsoever i desire to speak with him in regard to matters which i am sure he takes some interest in a gentleman a very dear and intimate friend of my own has been apprehended and committed for trial charged with an act which he did not commit and in regard to which i think mr norris may furnish some information which may be useful to my friend's defence that he won't replied oldkirk abruptly he'll inform against no one i'll answer for it you mistake and interrupt me said edgar adelon with a slight degree of haughtiness in his manner i neither expect nor desire that he should turn informer but i think he may be able to give me the names of several persons who saw my friend on the night in question and who can bear testimony to where he was at certain times so as to prove that it was impossible he could commit the crime with which he is charged that's another affair said martin oldkirk and if you assure me sir upon your word of honour that you have no other object than this i don't mind lending a hand but at the same time you see mr adelon when a thing is trusted to me by any persons i mustn't tell other people anything about it till i have asked leave that is fair enough answered edgar adelon i pledge you my word of honour that i have no other object whatever in seeking mr norris than that which i have stated and i have no objection to tell you the circumstances of the case in order that you may communicate them to mr norris himself before he sees me oh that's not needful sir replied the man i guess well enough what it is all about this gentleman that is accused of killing the young lord up at brandon who was buried t'other day i don't think you need trouble your head much about it for every one knows well enough he didn't do it and they'll never get a jury to condemn him but for the matter of that i don't blame a gentleman who wants to help a friend and an innocent man too at a pinch like that but you'll have a long way to go sir though it's all in your way home too i do not mind how far it may be answered edgar nor whether it be in my way or not mr norris i will see and this very night too if it be possible i am quite ready to go if you are willing 
"'Well, that's right,' replied Oldkirk. "'I like a man that's ready to do anything to serve a friend. "'So come along, we'll set to work at once. "'But you'll have to stay behind maybe for ten minutes or so while I last leave. "'If I get it, well enough. "'If I don't get it, I suppose you and I are to have a tussle.' "'I'll think of that as we go along,' answered Edgar Adelon. "'But at all events, we'll have a truce till you come back again from your mission. "'And fair play on both parts, my good friend.' agreed said old kirk and putting up his pistol in his breast again the young gentleman followed him quietly out of the house and taking his horse's bridle over his arm walked on by the man's side in perfect confidence this conduct seemed to please him not a little for he was much more conversable and open than he had been at first but he still kept a guard upon his communications taking care not to say a word which could lead his companion even to suspect where Norris lay concealed. The way was long, and the drenching rain poured upon the two wayfarers, as amongst the narrow lanes and between the high hedgerows which distinguished the inland parts of that country. They wandered on for more than an hour. They passed one village, a hamlet, and some scattered houses, but Edgar, in his wanderings, had made himself acquainted with every rood of the country round Brandon, and he perceived that each step he took brought him nearer home at length martin oldkirk stopped by the side of a little church at the distance of about five miles from the park and said now you must wait for me here master till i can get leave to bring you on but you're very wet and that's a bad thing for a genteel lad like you if you like it i can get you a glass of spirits from that farmhouse there where you see the light glimmering it would perhaps be better for me to go in there and wait for you replied edgar for although i care little about bad weather having been accustomed to brave it all my life yet the rain dashing heavily in one's face is not pleasant that will not do sir replied the man they might track us if they saw you and me together well then i will put my horse under the yew tree and go into the church porch said the young gentleman spirits i do not drink and shall do well enough without them there are worse things on a wet night answered the other and turning away he left edgar to follow his own course the church porch alluded to was a deep old norman projection from the face of a building the greater part of which was of more modern date for successive church wardens had each done his best to spoil by additions and improvements what had once been a small but very beautiful piece of architecture there however under the round and richly moulded arches edgar adelon found a temporary shelter while an old yew tree planted probably by saxon hands protected his horse from the fury of the storm time seemed to pass very slowly to his impatient spirit and as the porch approached close to the road he listened though for some time in vain for a coming step at length one sounded at a distance and in a minute or two more his guide was at his side well cried edgar eagerly what news it won't do sir to-night replied the man i was directed to tell you that you must not come on now but that if you will be there to-morrow evening at nine you will not only see him you want but get all the information that he can give it is very unfortunate answered edgar the assizes open the day after to-morrow this trial will be one of the first in all probability and we shall have no time to prepare but i will be wherever you will name of course or will you come and guide me i will be there waiting for you said the other but you must swear not to say one word to any person which can lead to find out where the gentleman is on any account whatever most willingly replied edgar adelon under no circumstances whatever by word or look or sign will i betray the place of his concealment upon my honour that will do rejoined old kirk and now to tell you where to come i dare say you know the country pretty well oh yes answered the young gentleman there are few parts within twenty miles round where i could not find my way well then do you know the old workhouse at langley asked the countryman it stands just at the back of the village perfectly replied edgar am i to be there you will find me near the door at nine to-morrow said old kirk and now master can you find your road home as easily as if it were broad day answered his companion 
and now old kirk let me say i am sorry i used a threat towards you but you must forgive it for when one is so deeply interested as i am in proving the innocence of a friend one often says things one would not say at another time there don't say any more about it replied the other maybe some day you may lend me a hand and that will clear all scores so good night sir edgar bade him farewell mounted his horse and spurred on towards brandon seeing not a living creature till he came within a hundred yards of the park gates his heart was lightened and his spirits which had been greatly depressed rose high at the thoughts of serving nay perhaps of saving one for whom from the first he had in his young enthusiasm conceived the warmest friendship the wind had somewhat abated but the rain still continued when he approached the park and the night was so dark that his horse was nearly upon a foot passenger before he saw him the person whom he overtook was walking slowly on with an umbrella covering his head and shoulders but the sound of the falling hoofs startled him and made him jump aside just as edgar checked his horse is that you edgar said mr filmer turning round and edgar immediately sprang to the ground apologizing for having nearly ridden over him the truth is father he said i was riding fast to catch eda before she goes to bed and to tell her tidings which have made me very joyful let me share them said father filmer for if i judge rightly they will be joyful to me too i am sure they will cried edgar forgetting in the light-heartedness of the moment the caution which eda had given by this time to-morrow i trust to be able to prove dudley's innocence beyond a doubt that is indeed most satisfactory answered the priest but are you quite sure my young friend youth is apt to be sanguine too sanguine alas not to meet with disappointment i trust such will not be the case now answered edgar adelon for at nine to-morrow i am to meet one who can give me information if he will mr filmer was well aware that his hold upon the mind of the young gentleman who was now walking on beside him was much less strong than that which he possessed over daniel connor sir arthur adelon or even mr clive he knew that to attempt to force his secrets from him by representing a full communication thereof to the priest in the light of a religious duty would be at once treated by edgar as a ridiculous assumption and that he must therefore take a very different course with him from that which he had pursued with others as indeed he had done in addressing every one of the persons i have named above to no two of them had he put forth exactly the same motives in exercising the influence which he possessed over them the general line he took was still the same indeed though he modified his arguments to each individual but now he was obliged in a degree to choose a new direction i seek no confidence my son he said but that which is voluntary you have been a little reserved lately but that matters not though perhaps i might have aided you more than you know when i ask you therefore who is the person you have to meet and where you are to meet him i do not want you to tell me anything you may be disposed to conceal and have only in view your own safety for you must remember edgar that these are somewhat dangerous times and if i am not much mistaken the people you have to deal with are rash and violent men who will not scruple at anything which may serve their purpose there is not the slightest danger answered edgar adelon i know who and what they are quite well and they know that i would not betray them for any consideration whatever that which prevents me from telling you who i am going to meet and where is that which has hitherto prevented me from speaking with you as openly as i could wish namely that the affairs with which i have to do are not my own and that other persons are compromised throughout the whole matter i could not therefore in honour reveal to you any of the particulars and in this case especially i am bound by a most solemn promise to discover nothing to any one it is very well replied the priest i have no curiosity and i shall be perfectly satisfied if you can prove that our young friend is totally innocent at nine to-morrow did you say well may you be successful for i myself am quite sure of mr dudley's innocence and therefore trust it may be clearly established you had better therefore mount again and get home to your fair cousin as soon as possible 
for I know she is very anxious, unnecessarily so, I believe, but we must always make allowances. Thus saying, he seemed to drop the subject, and after walking a few steps farther with him, Edgar Adelon sprang into the saddle and rode on towards Brandon Park. End of chapter 23chapter twenty four of the convict by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty four by half past eight o'clock edgar adelon was at the door of the old workhouse at langley the building had long been disused but though not in the best order in the world it could not be said to have fallen into decay when a harsh and parsimonious law was substituted for one which was excellent in itself but had been long and sadly misused when poverty was first virtually pronounced criminal and punished by statute when the vices of the past and the follies of rich magistrates were visited upon the present generation and upon the heads of the poor when those whom god had joined together were put asunder by legislation and when a deputy parliament irresponsible directly to the people was created to make laws and regulations for those who are denied a voice in the senate or a vote at an election when the medical attendance of the sick and the needy was first contracted for by scores as bullocks and sheep are paid for at a toll-gate when charity put on a pedant's gown and national benevolence was circumscribed by iron theories the poor of langley had been transferred to the union house and the old workhouse had been put up to auction it was bought by a person who wished to establish a school a wild eccentric clever philanthropist who fancied that he could bend man's stubborn nature to his own utopian schemes of excellence the school however as might have been expected proved a complete failure and after keeping it up for two years he abandoned it in despair no purchaser could be found to take the building off his hands and leaving the charge of it to an old man and his wife he spent a few pounds annually in checking the course of decay but seemed to forget it altogether except when he paid the bills there was a little space of ground round it and a low wall and within that wall edgar adelon now stood waiting for the coming of his guide he doubted not that the person he sought was to be discovered within the large rambling old building and finding that his impatient spirit had carried him thither a good deal before the time he walked round it more than once looking up at the windows to see if he could discover the room which norris inhabited all was dark however except where from a room on the ground floor close to the door streamed forth a solitary light and mounting the steps the young gentleman looked in and perceived the old man in charge and his wife seated at their little fire he now began to doubt that norris was there it might merely be a place of rendezvous he thought and as time wore on he fancied that his guide was long in coming and then that he would not come the night formed a strong contrast with the last it was fine and calm and clear and at length a step was heard at a good distance approaching rapidly edgar would not wait for the newcomer's approach but went to meet him and in a few minutes he perceived the figure of martin oldkirk i say you are too soon said the man i am before my time but come on and we shall soon find him we want now wait here for me a minute he continued when they reached the door of the workhouse and walking round towards the back he disappeared after remaining impatiently for about five minutes edgar thought he heard a bolt withdrawn and expected to gain admission but the sound ceased again and in an instant or two afterwards he heard a step once more the next moment the voice of oldkirk called him and he found the countryman standing at the western angle of the building stop a minute mr adelon said the man are you very sure that you have not let out the secret to any one to no one upon earth answered edgar you surely do not suspect me of such baseness no sir i don't suspect you of baseness at all replied oldkirk but young gentlemen will be imprudent sometimes i have not in this instance at all events answered edgar i have not said a word to anybody which could give the slightest idea of whither i was going when i came out it is strange enough answered the other in a thoughtful tone 
there are two men and a little boy standing talking together at this hour of night at the corner of the lane they seem to be doing nothing i wonder what they can want nothing connected with me depend upon it answered edgar becoming somewhat impatient it seems to me nothing unusual that two men should be standing there talking but the boy comes from a place close by brandon replied oldkirk i dare say it's all right however so we had better go in and proceeding to the door near which edgar had been waiting he opened it first lifting the latch the first room they came to was a little stone hall where paupers had often waited for their daily allowance of bread or meat or soup or for medical aid and there edgar adelon paused while oldkirk shut and bolted the door now we must find our way in the dark said the latter as soon as he had completed his task it won't do to carry a light about here keep close behind me sir following his footsteps edgar went forward through the door which closed behind them with a weight and pulley and then along a stone passage at the end of which the man said here are the stairs and mounting about twenty steps they came to the upper story of the building it seemed as far as the young gentleman could judge a strange rambling sort of place with rooms on the right hand and on the left and paved passages between them through several of which he was led till at length stopping suddenly old kirk said i'll wait for you here go straight on sir till you see a light shining through the keyhole of a door just push that open and go in but don't be longer than you can help edgar followed his directions without reply and a moment after in the turn of the passage to the left he saw the light the man had spoken of not only shining through the keyhole but through a chink of the door which was ajar pushing it open as he had been told to do he took a step forward and a scene unpleasant and even painful was before him the room was a small square chamber lined with squalid panelling and floored like the rest of the building with stone the rain of the preceding night had come through the roof at one corner staining the ceiling and the walls there was but one window covered not only with a large movable shutter formed of planks of wood but with a blanket pinned up with two forks so as to prevent the slightest ray of light from finding its way out through the crevices the air felt hot and close although there was neither fire nor fireplace and the night was cold in one corner was a bed of the most humble description without curtains and by its side stood a chair and a table the latter supporting several phials partly filled with medicine and a teacup as well as a solitary tallow candle with a long unsnuffed wick set in a large dirty tin candlestick the bedding seemed to consist of a mattress or pallias part of which was apparent two or three coarse rugs and a sheet and an ill-fitted bolster doubled up to support the head as soon as edgar entered the room the form of a man raised itself slowly and painfully up in the bed supporting itself on the right arm and a pair of hollow eyes gazed at him earnestly the head was surrounded with a bandage and the wild grey hair floated loose about it while beneath appeared a countenance full of intelligence but worn and haggard apparently with sickness and suffering the hue of robust health was totally gone and the pale yellow waxy tint of the skin seemed more sallow from a black plaster down one cheek and a grey and reddish beard of eight or nine days growth no one probably who had known norris in health would have recognised him at that moment and edgar adelon who had never seen him except once as a boy imagined at first that there must be some mistake association as it is called is perhaps one of the most extraordinary phenomena of the human mind not alone in the rapid power which it has of awakening recollection from the slumber of long years to the things of the past but in the strange difference of the means by which it is itself excited with one man it is a sight with another a sound with another an odour with another a taste which calls up suddenly scenes and circumstances and persons which have been long buried under the sand and rubbish of passing things in the course of years with edgar adelon the exciting cause in almost all instances was sound and the moment mr norris spoke he recollected his voice and the place where he had last beheld him and all that then took place flashed back 
upon his memory like a scene in a dream are you mr adelon demanded the wounded man the same answered edgar what not the boy who came to call upon mr sherborne with sir arthur adelon some six or seven years ago rejoined norris how you are changed greatly i believe replied edgar but you are very much changed too mr norris and i regret to see that the alteration has been effected by illness ay answered the other gloomily they have brought the strong man to infant weakness and the daring man to skulk in a hole like this if others had been as resolute and as vigorous the case would have been different but i have not regrets for myself mr adelon i regret that another opportunity has been lost for my country an opportunity which may never return i regret that my countrymen in their feebleness and their timidity have suffered the golden moment to slip from them after boasting that they were ready to seize it and to dare all odds to render it available to the common good they fled sir like a flock of sheep from a handful of men in red coats and i am almost hopeless of them i went down it is true almost at the first with a bitter wound in my side and my horse shot under me but if they had then rushed on high though they had trampled the soul out of my body they would have gained the day and i would have blessed them nevertheless the time may yet come and i will live for it only one success to give them confidence in themselves to knit them together to prove to them that they can fight and conquer if they will and all is secure it is the novelty of the thing that scares them and those frenchmen too who ran at the very first shot what do they deserve but i forget we are rambling from the point you seem to have been badly wounded indeed replied edgar as the sick man sunk back upon his pillow exhausted with the stern vehemence of his own thoughts but tell me mr norris have you proper attendance here such wounds as yours would need a skilful surgeon they were sharp ones answered norris and not few for i had just staggered up and was calling some few stout hearts around me when the cavalry dashed in amongst us one cut at me and gashed my cheek and another brought me down with a blow over the head they passed on thinking me dead and so i should have been very soon if that brave fellow oldkirk had not dragged me away and hiding me and himself in a dry ditch bound up my wounds and staunched the blood there has been many a man ennobled for a worse deed but he will have his reward here or hereafter the people here are very kind to me too i saved their little property for them one time by the few scraps of law i ever learned and they are grateful it is a marvel as this world goes i have a surgeon from a distant town and i drink his drugs and let him probe my wounds and let him torture me as much as he will not that i have any faith in him but because it pleases the good people who think that something is being done to serve me i need no surgeon mr adelon but nature and a strong constitution surgeons and lawyers the craft is much the same the one tortures and destroys the body the other the mind both rascally trades enough but let us think of other things you have been seeking me why i thought oldkirk had told you replied edgar i gave him all the needful particulars last night he told me something of it replied norris but not the whole besides i forget lying here in this gloomy sickness my thoughts wander over many things like the dove in the deluge finding no place to rest upon let me hear the business from your own lips it is very simple replied edgar adelon a friend for whom i have more deep regard than i feel for any man living is accused of having killed the young lord hadley on the very night of the attack upon barhampton he went out from brandon at about eight o'clock and was followed by that lord they were seen passing the lodge and walking on together in high dispute lord hadley was brought home dead having been struck off the cliff by some one whom the coroner's jury choose to believe was my friend not without some grounds it is true and edgar proceeded to detail the evidence given dwelling minutely upon the circumstances in order to show norris the danger of the position in which dudley was placed my friend he continued declares that he went on to the very gates of barhampton that night that lord hadley parted from him at the spot where the path from the grange crosses the high road and that he never saw him after he met several men near mead's farm it would seem but we have reason to believe that there were others scattered along the whole line of road he took and that some of them must have seen his parting from lord hadley and be able to bear testimony to the fact 
if you know as we imagine who these men were and can give me information so that their evidence may be obtained i beseech you mr norris to do so for the lawyers who have been brought from london assure us that is the only hope of obtaining a favourable verdict for my friend mr dudley mr dudley the friend of one of the name of adelon replied norris in a low marvelling tone that is a strange phenomenon an adelon strive to save a dudley that is stranger still but true your mother's was kindly of blood is your father aware of what you are doing my father is in london detained by business of importance answered edgar but i know to what you allude mr norris some quarrel existed in former years between my father and dudley's but that is no reason for enmity between their children a quarrel exclaimed norris raising himself again upon his arm do you know mr adelon that your father ruined his do you know but no you do not i will tell you dudley's mother was your father's first love they had been rivals for honours at school at the university and then they became rivals for her hand sir arthur was encouraged by the mother but charles dudley was accepted by the daughter he was successful here as he had always been before and your father is not a man to forget such things sir he ruined him i say it is false exclaimed edgar it cannot be true not true cried norris do you dare to tell me it is not true but this is all vain lying here the veriest child might insult me at will but i tell you it is true and i have the papers which prove it he waited long for his revenge but it came at last he took advantage of a temporary pressure on his enemy a pressure caused by his own acts and offered in kindly words to lend money on a mortgage merely and solely for the purpose of getting dudley's title deeds into his lawyer's possession for that cunning lawyer had taught him that there never was a title in which a flaw could not be found it was all done by his direction all done for one object the flaw was soon discovered the title disallowed the secret told to the next heir and mr dudley ruined i can prove it step by step the whole machinations from the beginning to the end for that lawyer was my partner and the papers are now in my possession and you use them mr norris replied edgar with a mixture of anger and sorrow in his tone to force my father on in a course which might be his ruin do not talk of ungenerous conduct for surely this was not generous i use them sir replied norris sternly to keep him to principles which he had long before asserted to promote the deliverance of my country to favour the people's right i have since regretted perhaps that i did so for i am weak like other men and the result having been unfortunate may wish i had not employed the means which the object justified i ought to have given those letters to mr dudley and will do so now if he and i both live and now sir with that knowledge before you i will help you to save the young man if you please edgar sat silent for a moment or two with his eyes bent fixedly upon the wall and norris at last asked what say you would you save him assuredly replied edgar adelon with a start can you doubt it whatever be the consequences can you suppose that i would hesitate to deliver my friend or that i would see an innocent man suffer for a crime in which he had no share then you are one of the noble and the true replied norris warmly one of the few the very very few give me your hand mr adelon and forgive me that i have pained you by such sorrowful truths edgar gave him his hand but turned away his head with a sigh and norris continued that every word i have uttered is true you shall have proof he said if i live i will show you those letters no answered edgar sharply i will not look into one page of them he is my father sir whatever he may have done to me he has no faults nor would i willingly see any in his conduct to other men if you will aid me to prove dudley's innocence mr norris i will thank you most deeply but say no more to me of my father or my father's acts so be it answered norris to mr dudley's business then first be sure he did not kill lord hadley i may know or at least guess who did but of that i can prove nothing secondly there was but one man as far as i recollect near the spot where the two roads cross my memory of that night is somewhat indistinct indeed 
but there may have been two one certainly was edward lane the blacksmith the other a man named harris living near barhampton but i am not sure of his station seek out lane first and tell him i sent you to him with my request that he will voluntarily tender his evidence he must make some excuse for being there at that hour of the night he is resolute and bold but somewhat wrong-headed and you may have trouble with him though i think my name will satisfy him the other man will tell you at once if he was there or not if you but say that i desire it tell mr dudley for me too that i regret much what has happened and that i cannot serve him farther you say that he went as far as the gates of barhampton i know not what could bring him thither and assuredly i did not see him there but that is no marvel for i have much to do he went upon a kindly errand mr norris replied edgar and certainly was there for he said it and dudley's word is not to be doubted but i will detain you no longer to-night as you seem exhausted and perhaps our conversation has been too long already i thank you much for the information you have given me and i am sure dudley will be grateful also thus saying the young gentleman shook hands with the sick man and left him End of chapter twenty four